Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It is an honor uh, to be with you this evening. And I want to extend my thanks to Eilish, Peter, and the members of FLAC for all the excellent work that you do and for organizing this event. Tonight we honor Dave Ellis, a community activist who dedicated his career to working with community groups on welfare rights, legal rights, and legal education. He established the Community Legal Resource to assist the nonprofit sector after working for many years at the Kulak Community Law Center, now known as the Center for Community Law and Mediation. I did not know Dave, but his spirit is with us tonight, both with those who remember his good deeds and those who now provide legal assistance to those in need, thanks to the programs that Dave helped encourage. Many of us in the legal world are inspired by people such as Dave Ellis, they provide an opportunity for a young lawyer to take an important job to assist a community. They provide guidance through a career. And they remind us that the law can be a powerful force for social justice. I also want to acknowledge the important work of FLAC and the critical role that you play in providing legal information, advice, and training to thousands of people across Ireland. I read in your recent report that you received more than 25,000 requests for assistance. You train more than 200 volunteers. You work with more than 100 NGOs and community organizations to help ensure that those who need legal assistance are able to obtain it. It is a critical service that you provide, and I know such work is not possible without a dedicated staff, strong leadership, and loyal supporters. And so tonight, we recognize your good work. And I am here as one of your clients to thank you for the assistance that you provided to my organization, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, so that we could pursue a critical case now before the Court of Justice about privacy and freedom in the digital age. EPIC routinely participates in important civil liberties cases in the U.S. courts, but we lack the ability and the legal authority to participate in cases before the European courts, and so we reached out to FLAC, who provided expert advice to us and helped us in this very important matter. But to understand our case, I need to tell you a little bit more about our organization. We began 25 years ago in the first public campaign to protect the freedom to use encryption. At the time, the US National Security Agency, an organization that Edward Snowden helped make famous, had the idea that people should not be able to use strong techniques for privacy and security because it might obstruct criminal investigations and intelligence collection. And so they proposed a technical standard to enable government access to private communications. When the proposal was put forward, we, a small group of experts in Washington, turned to others and said, well, what do you think of this? And they said, well, the danger of weak encryption is that you will make it possible for the bad guys, for the criminals, and for the spies to get access to private communications. We respected the concerns that the government had about protecting public safety, but we also said at the time that if the clipper chip proposal went forward, the internet would be forever vulnerable. And so we sent a polite letter to the President of the United States signed by 42 legal scholars and technical experts. We posted it on the internet. And in a short period of time, about 50,000 people signed on to our letter. We had, in fact, the first internet petition. Looking around the room, I see quite a few young people. Let me tell you, 25 years ago, 50,000 internet users was a lot of people. 
Nowadays, it's like a chat room on Facebook. <laughs> but back then, we were really doing something. And the program <laughs> was suspended. It was suspended because when we had the opportunity to bring people together to organize and to inform the policymakers, even about an issue as complex as the use of encryption and internet communications, we were able to make a difference. And that was the time that we decided to launch Epic. And we decided also that in creating this organization, we had to stand apart from the industry groups. We had to stand apart from government, which meant that we couldn't take any funding from any of the companies. We couldn't take any grants from any of the government agencies. When we raised a concern, launched a campaign, or filed a suit, we needed the freedom and the independence to say we were doing this because we thought it was the right thing to do. We spent many years pursuing privacy and open government cases. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about our work concerning Facebook. But I want to tell you also about a very important campaign that we began shortly after the 2016 presidential election in the United States. At the time, our focus, as I said, was privacy and open government. But we quickly became aware, following that election, that substantial questions had been raised about foreign interference in democratic institutions, the manipulation of social media, to promote political division, to distribute fake news, and to push out propaganda, and even <coughs> questions about financial relations between foreign governments and US political candidates. It was no longer for us simply a question about the protection of fundamental rights. It was now a question about how to protect democratic institutions how to preserve the rule of law, and how to maintain an independent judiciary. And so in January of 2017, we launched a, launched a project to determine the extent of Russian interference with the 2016 election. And we filed several significant Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, which I'll tell you about now. We filed a lawsuit against the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Now, you may not be familiar with this government organization. It's actually a surprisingly small organization, but it sits at the very top of the US intelligence apparatus, more than 17 departments below, and it coordinates all the information that's being received by the intelligence agencies on behalf of the US government. The ODNI had determined that the Russians had launched a multi-pronged attack against the 2016 election, exploiting, among other things, the use of Facebook in their efforts to change the outcome of that election. They had also deployed automated internet accounts, known as bots, that could respond in real time and provoke responses on Facebook and Twitter and else to try to make more critical uh, political dialogue. We were interested in the full extent of the report, not simply the document that had been shared with the public in an unclassified setting. And so we sued for the release of the classified report that had been prepared among the government agencies. And we found that the findings within the classified report matched, in fact, the public report. All of the information had been known to the federal agencies about the extent of Russian interference. We filed another open government lawsuit against our FBI to try to determine if there had been an adequate response to the cyber attacks against US political organizations. And there were disappointed to learn that in fact there had not been sufficient warning. I heard one story that was told by the uh, campaign advisor to Hillary Clinton. 
John Podesta. Is this name familiar to you? John Podesta has probably had the most famous hack of a private email account of any email user in history because it was his email that was disclosed by WikiLeaks at a moment, a critical moment in the campaign in an effort to discredit Hillary Clinton. And there are still now investigations concerning the relationship between the Trump Organization, WikiLeaks, and the release of the Podesta emails. But the question we were interested in was, did the FBI do an adequate job protecting the political organizations that were participating in the election from the foreign cyber attack? And I had the opportunity to ask John Podesta about this, and he told me this story. He said, you know, on Friday, CNN began reporting that my email had been obtained by WikiLeaks and was being distributed on the internet. All week long, I watched the television and I saw news reports about my email being distributed on the internet. And I got calls from friends and worried messages and spoke with supporters and it was a very difficult time. He said, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, I got a call from the FBI. They said, is this Mr. Podesta? He said, yes it is. He said, the agent said, we have reason to believe your email account may have been compromised. <laughs> he said, you think? <laughs> so we also had concerns about the efforts to safeguard the political organizations in the United States from foreign cyber attack. Even in the growing trend toward the use of the internet for elections and internet-based voting, some of you may be aware that there's a real controversy now as to whether that's safe, whether you can do election voting on the internet. Many of the computer experts say that we should stay with a paper ballot. You can have an optically uh, scanned paper ballot if you want to count your votes more quickly, but the paper provides a type of verification that helps ensure the integrity of the final vote that you simply will not have if it's an electronic-only election. And we pursued that case as well. Let me tell you about a case um, that surprises people sometimes, but I'm very happy that we're in the midst of it and making progress. The case is Epic versus Internal Revenue Service. And you may think it's odd that a privacy group would seek the tax returns of an individual. But it's actually a well-established tradition in the United States that candidates for public office, particularly for the presidency, make their tax <coughs> records available so that it's possible to know whether there are conflicts of interest or secret dealings that might compromise a person if elected to public office. And I should point out, as someone who also teaches uh, privacy law, that this view of privacy is very much consistent with that of Justice Louis Brandeis, who wrote a very famous article on the right to privacy published in the U.S. more than 100 years ago. It was a foundational article. Brandeis was describing the need to create legal protections for true private facts about individuals, not defamatory statements or things that are said with malice, but those facts about our private lives that we might choose not to share with others. It was a very powerful legal claim when it was put forward in this article, and eventually the U.S. courts and others began to adopt it as a legal right. But in announcing this right, Brandeis also made a counter-argument. He said, as important as the right to privacy is, the right of the public to know about a person is also important, particularly when that person chooses to stand for public office. And what we might consider to be private for the private person, and we should protect in law, he said for the public person, we may need to look more closely. And I had that view in mind when we filed our case against candidate Trump, the first candidate for the U.S. presidency in 40 years 
who chose to withhold his tax returns. President Trump, though, had made a remarkable claim. He said that if you had correctly tabulated the popular vote, you would have won that, he would have won that as well. Even though he had lost, I think, by about three and a half million votes to Hillary Clinton, there were extensive allegations he made of voter fraud. Now, no one took this particularly seriously until he decided to create a Commission on Election Integrity, which in its first act set about contacting state election officials and asked the state election officials to turn over the state voter data to this <coughs> presidential commission to try to figure out if the votes had been accurately tabulated. This was scary. I have to say, speaking as an American, we've never before experienced quite that reach from the federal government into the state election system. The states protect the voting process and the federal government has respected the role of the states in that process. But this is where it became very interesting for EPIC. We needed to develop a legal strategy to block the collection of the state voter data. And we thought to ourselves, how in the world are we going to stop this? This is a presidential commission. It has the White House behind it. All of these uh, powerful people have now been on the commission. And one of our very smart young lawyers, Epic Like Flack, has a lot of very smart young folks working for us, said, well, I wonder if they ever conducted a privacy impact assessment before they made that request to the state election officials. And I said, a what? And they said, well, there's this legal requirement that before you build a new database in the US federal government, you're actually required to conduct a privacy impact assessment. And we discussed and said, that's kind of clever, actually. So we turned the case against the Presidential Advisory Commission into a legal claim that whether or not the commission should do this, either way, they still had the obligation to conduct the privacy impact assessment, which they had failed to do. So we gathered our experts. We looked at the collection of the data. There was no privacy impact assessment, but it got even worse through a series of interrogatories with the people responsible for managing the data collection, we learned that they were storing the data on a White House computer server, which said specifically on the server instructions, not for the storage of personal data. Now the case is getting really good. And when we filed our motion for preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order, the White House suspended the program, deleted the data they had wrongfully obtained. We spent the next uh, six months in court against the Presidential Commission, and then in January of this year, the Commission was shut down and the program was put to an end. So that was a pretty good accomplishment for a little NGO in Washington, D.C. It felt a bit like the Clipper campaign 25 years ago, but it also suggested to us the growing connection between the protection of democratic institutions, which I said in 2017 we set out to pursue, in the increasing importance of privacy and data protection in our modern world. Now, I want to say a few words uh, about Epic and Facebook and privacy and FLAC. I'll begin by asking how many people here are on Facebook? Oh, come on, you can raise your hands. You don't need to be ashamed. I am. It's okay. You don't really have a choice, do you? I mean, if you weren't happy about how Facebook was operating its social network service with 2.3 billion users, it's not like you can go across the street and sign up for another social network service with 2.3 billion users. You're pretty much out of the social network business, right? So that's one of the first things we understand about Facebook 
and its dominance of the internet economy. We've been involved, I'll start with that word, we've been involved with Facebook for more than a decade. And it was back in 2007 when Facebook began to change its business practices to enable it to use the personal data of its users in ways that people had not signed up for or agreed to or were even aware of, that we started to object. And we said just because someone has posted something on their Facebook page doesn't mean you should go run off and tell an advertiser this person wants to take a vacation to Spain, maybe you should give them an ad for vacations to Spain. And we began to see that the personal data that people were sharing with their friends on Facebook, which is how it was presented to users, was the material of the online advertising business model that the company was developing to turn its users really into a commercial product for advertisers. And we launched a substantial campaign against Facebook in 2007 and 2008. The company was very embarrassed. Mark Zuckerberg gave the first of what came to be many apologies that I think he's made over time and said, we're going to be better. We're going to create a system for public participation. We're going to vote on our changes. I was teaching a class in privacy law at Georgetown. We had a debate with the chief privacy officer from Facebook in the classroom and a young woman uh, from Norway who started a campaign called Facebook Users Against the New Terms of Service, which grew to, I think, about 150,000 users. And they were objecting to the new terms of service that would enable Facebook to engage in these various marketing practices that people didn't like. And so Facebook said at the time, all right, we'll change our operation. We'll create public participation. We'll have democratic decision making. We said, wonderful, we're all very happy, problem solved. And as you know, it's been a wonderful forum for democratic participation for many years. No, <laughs> not true. Uh, in fact, one of the first things that Facebook did after the successful campaign was organized by the user group, Facebook users against the new terms of service, Facebook said you can no longer create a user group that includes the name Facebook. Try it, by the way. I mean, go back to your account tonight. You, you can try to create, you know, Facebook users for peace and love. It won't happen, because under the new terms of service, you can't use the company name. That was the response to a successful online campaign 10 years ago by Facebook users to try to prevent the changes in the terms of service. Well, now we were getting very upset, because Facebook had broken their commitment, they were no longer promoting the democratic principles they had backed, they prevented online organizing, they were very happy, by the way, when people used the service to do online organizing in the Middle East and other parts of the world, they didn't, just didn't want any online organizing against their own company. And so we went to the U.S. Federal Trade Commission in 2009, and we filed a formal complaint and we documented all the changes in the business practices. We explained how these practices were inconsistent with the representations that the company had made. The FTC's authority, which is to investigate unfair and deceptive trade practices, we had previously relied upon in cases that we had brought against uh, Microsoft. And as I said at the outset, we're very even-handed. You know, we go after everybody. No one is paying us to go after their competitor. But by 2009, it really was Facebook's turn. And so we went to the Federal Trade Commission. We had the backing of more than a dozen US consumer NGOs. We filed a complaint that went on for more than 30 pages, very factual, not political, explaining the legal rules and providing the facts. 
And then we spent the next two years trying to get the FTC to act on our complaint. We filed addition, sub, additional submissions, more supplements, and then in November of 2011, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission issued a sweeping judgment against Facebook. It said, as we have alleged, that the company had violated the privacy preferences of the users. It said, as we have alleged, that the company had disclosed user data to third parties without meaningful consent. It said, as we had alleged, that the company had failed to establish meaningful privacy and security protections. Federal Trade Commission even came up with some things that we missed. And I'm reading the judgment and the announcement and thinking, this is, this is fantastic. We've established a regulatory framework that will ensure accountability and prevent the misuse of personal data on Facebook for years to come. And now you're probably all thinking, well, how did that work out? Not so well, right? Because in the years that followed, Facebook engaged in many of the practices that violated the settlement with the FTC in 2011. And we brought complaints to the FTC. In fact, at one point, we even sued the FTC for their failure to enforce their own consent orders. Think about that. This is the agency that we had gone to to seek support. We had celebrated the judgment. They failed to enforce their order, and now we have to sue them to try to get action. I trust you, we were not invited to their Christmas party that year. Didn't make the cut, not on the list, not at all. But this tragedy here, and the lesson, and the reminder of the important work that we're all doing, is that if the FTC had acted, if the FTC had enforced the consent order, if the FTC had given judgment to that legal, mean, to that legal order, we might not have had Cambridge Analytica. We might not have had Brexit, and we might not have had the election of Donald Trump. This is what happens when an agency fails to uphold its responsibilities to safeguard the public interest. And you may be a little bit surprised to hear this from me tonight. Perhaps you were expecting me to be very critical of Facebook. But oddly, I actually have a certain amount of admiration for the company. And I imagine that there are folks here from Facebook tonight, happy to see you. Please don't change my privacy settings after this talk. But it is a smart, innovative company that's doing interesting things. That's what we expect from the private sector. But you see, from the public sector, from the government agencies, we expect people to protect the public interest. And when they fail to do so, there are real consequences. And these consequences with the internet economy happen quickly, they're widely felt, and they can provoke enormous harm. I can't begin to tell you, although I'm trying, to express how very serious I think it was that the US Federal Trade Commission, in seven years, since November of 2011, has not found a single infraction by Facebook under the consent order I just described. The story is actually even a little bit worse than that. Because after Cambridge Analytica became known, and after US politicians were aware of this matter, the Federal Trade Commission in March of this year announced that it was reopening its investigation of Facebook. And we said, oh, this is wonderful, this is very good news, thank you so much. Well, it's now December. I don't plan to look under the tree for a judgment from the FTC. I would like to see an announcement. And, you know, to, to speak of a, another data, well, I'll tell you about the excellent work of the Irish DPA, but the British DPA, the Informationer, uh, the Information Commissioner in, in the UK, Elizabeth Denham, 
In March, she announced an investigation. In September, she had an extensive report published, a fine and a judgment. That's good work. That is an accomplishment, and that means a meaningful result. So, EPIC is now before the Court of Justice with the support of FLAG, arguing that privacy is a fundamental right in the information age, that it cannot be waived by means of contract and privacy preferences and other shenanigans that companies might try to extract the data from people that they would not willingly give up. This is a very important case, and I look forward to a favorable outcome. But before I close, I want to share with you also what I see as a new challenge uh, to us in this age of data protection and transparency and the protection of democratic institutions. And that concerns the growing significance of artificial intelligence. Now, I will be the first to admit that people probably use that phrase a little bit too freely. We talk about almost any output from a computer system today as an AI-based output, or maybe it's just part of the promotion. If you want to launch an internet company, you tell everyone it's AI-enabled. Oh, and by the way, you're also using blockchain, because that's really popular too. But at the end of the day, the issue with AI and people is about the automation of decision making. It is about the automation of decision making in employment, in housing, in credit, in airport security, and even in criminal sentencing. Judges in the US today are looking at computer programs to tell them whether someone goes to jail for six months or two years. And there are companies that say, we've examined the data very closely, we've objectively determined that if your aim is to reduce recidivism, you don't want repeat offenders, then this person gets two years for the same offense that this person receives only six months. And if you ask the question, why does this person get two years? And this person only gets six months. The company says, well, we're very sorry, but of course, it's a proprietary technique. And if we were to tell you, in fact, the basis of the determination, we would be out of business, and all the good research that we've done to optimize sentencing, to minimize recidivism, would be lost. Well, that's an interesting argument. We brought a case earlier this year to the US Federal Trade Commission when we learned about a company that had come up with what they called the universal tennis rating. And their thought was that you could enable tennis players, young scholastic players, to compete in different uh, tournaments across the country if you could only assign a number to them that would allow comparable players to be matched against one another. So instead of saying, well, the number one player, tennis player in New York, plays the number one player from California, or the you know, best 10 under age 12 play, or however else you might do it, we're going to start giving young athletes uh, numbers. So, okay, uh, how's the number derived? I mean, if, if my daughter is 11.9, and her best friend is 12.2, but my daughter's actually beating her best friend, how is it that her score is 11.9, but her best friend is 12.2? And the answer from the company is again, well, that's a proprietary technique. We can't really tell you how we do that. That's actually the basis of our business model. And this struck me as very odd, because traditionally, certainly in the US and high school athletics, when you're talking about achievement, for example, you know, does someone run a mile in under five minutes? The numbers are objective, they're public, they're easily comparable. There's nothing secret in the world of athletic achievement when it comes to time or distance. It's all objective, it's all provable. 
But somehow we're entering a world, not only in sports, by the way, but also in education, where we are creating secret scores of our children that we can't even validate. Any Black Mirror viewers here? Just checking. That was a reference to a Black Mirror episode. Scary Netflix show, but you should see it. How did we respond to this challenge? A number of years ago, Epic launched a campaign in support of algorithmic transparency. And our point was really a simple one. We said, where these automated decisions are being made about individuals, we should be able to obtain the basis of the decision. We should ensure that it's accurate, and we should be able to validate it. And we're not saying, by the way, that it's necessarily wrong, or that computers shouldn't make decisions about people. But when, what we are saying is that when these decisions are made, we need to be able to examine them and to prove them. Now, I've had some very interesting debates with some very smart people over the last few years about algorithmic transparency. And they've said to me, Mark, well, that's a very nice thought. We appreciate what you're trying to do. But let me tell you, this stuff is so complicated. There's machine learning. There's neural networks. We can't replicate results. We can't prove results. It's far more complex than it used to be. And I say to these very smart people, so if I understand you're creating programs and systems that produce results, you don't know how they're produced, you can't prove them, and you can't replicate them. And I say, well, yes, that's right. I said, how do you feel about that? I mean, how do you feel as the judge who's told this person receives a two-year sentence and this person receives a six-month sentence for the same crime, but you, as the judge, won't actually know why that distinction is made. So what we have done in the context of our work in support of algorithmic transparency just in the last few months was to rally support for a new human rights framework which we have called the Universal Guidelines for Artificial Intelligence. And I want to say a, a few uh, kind words about your Data Protection Commissioner, Helen Dixon, who I'm a big fan of. I think you have one of the great champions for data protection in the EU and Ireland. It doesn't mean she's beyond criticism, but she's doing very good work. And she was with us in Brussels when we held a meeting of civil society in conjunction with the annual meeting of the Data Protection Commissioners, and we put forward the Universal Guidelines for Artificial Intelligence, which set out 12 principles. The guidelines were endorsed by more than 200 experts from 40 different countries, including even some of those skeptics who said to me early on, it's too difficult to explain. When they had the chance to think about it, they said, maybe we do need some guidelines. And we had 60 NGOs, along with our 200 experts. You'll find them online, Universal Guidelines for AI. I think they will appear as common sense. They will be familiar. We talk about transparency. We talk about fairness. We talk about accountability. But we talk about something else, which is frankly controversial. And that is, we make clear that we object to any national score assigned by a government to its citizens or residents. We do not want to live in a world where governments get to decide, as some do already, what someone's value is to the state. This Chinese social credit score not only awards points for your support of the state and deducts points for your criticisms, but it even looks at your social networks. And if your friends are unpopular with the state, then your score goes down. Your friends are popular, your score goes up. It doesn't take much imagination 
to imagine what that world will look like. And I think in some respects, it will be the ultimate test of our democratic institutions, whether we will be able to resist the logic of big data, AI, in the increasing automation of decisions about individuals to, pre to prevent a world in which we are all assigned such scores. Well, that's a little creepy, right? Um, and maybe a few years off. But along the way, we still have some important cases to fight. We still look to the very good work of the institutions of the European Union and of Ireland. We support the GDPR and the decisions of the European Court of Justice on data protection. But it will always be our goal to push forward in the legal context claims that protect the fundamental rights of individuals. Because at the end of the day, access to justice in this modern digital world is going to be the ability to hold to account the technologies and companies that are shaping our lives. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and answer any questions.